Welcome to the talk show, Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. The goal of this show is to provide a learning experience to people of all ages, with guests from various fields in academics, a wide range of industries, and insight into the many forms of art, athletics, and entertainment. We hope you enjoy the show. CEO of AMG Music, Film, and Television, Mark Berry is our guest today. Mark will speak about his passion for entertainment as well as his experiences with engineering and remixing. Mark has worked with titans in the industry, and we are very excited that he's joining us today. Hello, and welcome to the talk show, Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. With me today is the founder of MAG Music and Film Company, Mark Berry. We hope to learn a lot about how Mark's company helps artists, writers, and filmmakers alike. Let's bring him on. Mark Berry, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you very much for having me, Mark. It's our pleasure. Uh, you know, uh, Mark, your incredible resume of work is so vast, but uh, it kind of begs the question, how did you become involved in the industry? My understanding is it's, you started as a team. Yeah. Uh, so I went to, um, uh, you know, the Vietnam War was raging. Um, every night after dinner, we'd go downstairs in the den and, you know, you'd watch Walter Cronkite and Back in the day, all you saw were body bags coming off the planes and, you know, it was just a, a mess. So I looked at my parents and said, they're going to grab me. You know, my brother, David, he joined the Navy. So he was safe in the middle of South Pacific somewhere. And um, and he said, OK, what do you want to do? I said, well, you know, I like records, sounds, you know. And um, so I uh, enrolled at the Institute of Audio Research, which was on University Place down by NYU. And I did my junior and senior year. Uh, in the evenings. Uh, that's, your junior, that's your junior and senior high school years. High school years. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So uh, so I did that. And um, all while that is going on, I'm, I'm plotting my, my getaway. And uh, I said, okay, well, you know, I really like the Beatles. You know, I like... I like this guy, George Martin, you know, let me, let me pound on doors and in, uh, in the UK. So I got it, got a ticket, told my parents the plan and, um, and they agreed to it. And, uh, I graduated from the Institute of Audio Research, graduated from Fox Lane High School in Bedford in Westchester County. And, uh, I was on an airplane June 28th. So June 28th will be my 50th year, uh, in the business. That's incredible. As, and as you know, we talked earlier, I'm from Westchester County too. And yep, yep. Uh, small world, small world. But now we talk about a small world to the big world. So, yes. so Mark, what is this media landscape and how does uh, your company, AMG, help people navigate it? Okay, so uh, it's the media business now. It's not the music business or the film business or TV, but it's the media business, okay? Uh, and AMG has several divisions. Um, we acquire uh, feature length films um, ready for uh, distribution. We have a deal with uh, Factory Film here in Canada for distribution. So we service 150 digital service platforms, the world's airlines in flight entertainment. We do hotel VOD, AVOD, which is this new advertising model, SVOD, a subscription model. And uh, we get finished, completed movies out. And some of those movies we actually put our clients' music in. So there's, there's that revenue stream uh, as well. The music side, uh, we're still very proactive. I'm still producing. I do produce a couple of records a year. I still love doing it. Uh, I didn't really follow the digital curve. I'm an analog guy. So um, there's engineers out there that do a lot better than I do. But thank God my, my ears still work. So uh, and then there's the, uh, the television side. We have several shows in development that uh, we acquire the concept, we acquisition, develop them further, develop them further, and then pound on doors and say, hey, you know, uh, because with the advent of uh, streaming television, you know, all these eyeballs have gone to the streaming world. So, um, I mean, Netflix alone picked up 60 million new subscribers in the last two years of the pandemic. That's on top of 145 million they already had, right. right? So there's a lot of eyeballs, which means there's a lot of eyeballs, there's a lot of subscription rates. And the only way they can keep those subscription eyeballs is to have new, fresh, exciting content. So uh, that's, that's really AMG. We have a promotion and marketing division for music clients. They come in with a record. They just spent, you know, 20, 30 grand on making, you know, in a local studio. And they don't know, they don't know the first thing about maximizing the revenue streams. So we can do Spotify playlisting. We can do film, television, video game, ad agency, movie trailers, 
you know, production companies, anywhere we can generate third-party revenue. Digital radio, we service 33,000 digital radio stations worldwide. We service 168,000 film and TV contacts uh, worldwide. <clears throat> all looking to put music into film and TV, especially with all the new programming that's out there. It all needs music, right? Well, there's also so much that you do, but there really is. You said you're an analog guy, but there's a tr you're talking about 50 years coming up next month. There's a you had to pivot quite a bit. This is like you know to, to bring it down a notch. This is like the people who said, "What do you mean you didn't have microwaves when you were younger?" You know, so they're like, <laughs> "Yeah, it's exactly, impossible." Exactly. You exactly. stared at the oven for 45 minutes and said, "Is this going to cook or not?" So you really had to pivot quite a bit. And, I, I, and, I really did. You know, from a sonic standpoint, right. we used to use the audio tape as like an additional compressor, you know, we would load the tape up at zero when in actuality we're recording at plus three. Some, some tape would take plus six. So, and that's how, when you recorded it, that's how it came back louder off the tape for you. Right. When the digital came along, when you did that, all you got was, you know, it was distorted. Uh, and that was uh, the, the main problem that I had uh, with the uh, uh, digital recording. But, uh, and also we, we, we kind of lost the peaks and the valleys. It's this, you know, this this cut and paste thing. You know, I, I listen to the, you know, I'm a big fan of old Philly soul records, Harold Melvin, all the Philly International recordings. You know, I listen to those records and I'm in like, like these are recordings, man. These are like, and you can tell like they're live off the floor, right? It was just like great musicians. They went out there, they played it. I mean, I mean, how many times could you tell Teddy Pendergrass to, to re-sing a line? Come on, you know? And the business has changed so much. I remember kind of way back when people, artists were discovered at a bar singing, a producer was in the audience and Hey, mm -hmm. gotta have that guy. And I have a friend who, you know, uh, went into music and he said, Oh, we love your music. We want to sign you. You're the best. When you have a million YouTube hits, come back, we'll sign you. Exactly. Comes the old exactly. Justin Bieber, you know, uh, Usher type situation. And yep. uh, it's, you know, people, people don't know how, how, how difficult it is and how things have changed. So I know you're, you're involved in so much media, but mm -hmm. uh, it really is kind of a little name drop time. And most of these people will be in music, but you have, you know, you worked with the likes of Joan Jett, Paul McCartney, Carly Simon, New Edition, Deep Purple, Duran Duran, Alicia Billy yeah. Idol, Boy George and more. I would read them yeah. all off, but I don't have that kind of time. So, so <laughs> I mean, it, it would take me 50 years to read it. So. These are all, though, very different artists in their own right, but what do they all have in common? Well, uh, my expertise was when I, got a, when I came back to New York from England, I got a job at, uh, with Maynard and Seymour Solomon at Vanguard Records, which was a, you know, uh, one of the leading independent you know, jazz, folk, country, bluegrass. You know, it was like one of the old, great, great uh, indie, indie labels. And I got a job with Maynard and Seymour, and 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 I just learned so much uh, uh, through them. And I kind of got involved in this as late '70s disco dance uh, YMCA uh, craze, um, and I was really good at it. I I I, I knew how to make a, a record pound, you know. So I kind of they kind of would always send me back in, say, "Oh, make it longer for the clubs," and you know. So I'd make a you know a three three and a half minute song. Uh, I'd make it a, you know, a seven minute song. And, uh, and then word got out that I was doing these mixes and, and all kinds of stuff at Vanguard and, and then independent artists, started, independent artists and producers started coming to me, Arthur Baker, John Roby, um, Eddie O'Loughlin from Next Plateau and all kinds of great legendary label owners and producers. And, uh, and I just started making, so I made my name in the business as a dance remixer where i take the original tracks from the seven inch and then do some overdubs dance them up feel them up a little bit and and then remix them and and get them out and i was just you know i was a real lucky kid i was they just kept you know i was a, we're gonna polygram they just kept throwing them at me you know there's a funny story is where I was, I was at polygram records and i was working in the uh urban department and I was at an A and R meeting and and I'm standing in the in the in the background. I'm the only white kid in the room, right? And then Jerome Gasper stands up. He goes, Oh, well, you know, we got you know uh, Mark Mark Barry's here, you know, and he's gonna uh, show, give you you know a little pep talk on what the mixes we got coming in. And I, by then I had done Cool and the Gang, I had done Cameo, Gwen Guthrie, like these were big big dance records. And they turned around and they go, Oh my God, 
we thought you were black, right? <laughs> we are the, you got Mark Berry and you got Chuck Berry. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so uh, you know, that was a big, a big wake up call for me that I had to, you know, I found something that I, I, mean, I really enjoyed doing it as well. You know, I enjoyed making these, these mixes and then, you know, going to Studio 54 and saying, oh my God, they love this record, you know? Well, Mark, how did you get people to, you know, you mentioned how young you were. Was it hard for you to get people, titans in the industry, uh, veterans in the industry to respect you, to listen to you and uh, to understand you for who you were? You know, Sir George uh, Martin gave me a tremendous break uh, in the business and I got it. That was my first job. And that was me just like coming back the next day to get into the studio, to see the studio manager. They weren't there. An engine assistant engineer comes out and says, who are you? I'm Mark Berry. You know, I'm from New York City. Oh, you're from New York? Oh, come on in. You're from New York, you know? And here I am sitting out with the Alan Clark. He was the lead singer for the Hollies. And here I am, you know, looking at, uh, you know, D. Murray, the bass player for Elton John, was playing bass. And uh, I can't I can't believe this. I'm, just, I'm sitting here with, you know, some of these legendary musicians in the professional studio. It's owned by Sir George Martin. And then uh, Joyce Moore, the studio manager, came back to me. Because I kept coming back the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day. And then I go downstairs for a coffee or a, or a, a, a cigarette, a pack of smokes. And uh, then they say, you know, can I get you a pack of smoke? You know, I'm going for a coffee. You want a coffee? So, you know, I was, I was a great tea boy in, in England. I was a great tea boy. Uh, and then, uh, and then I, I got a job there. And then I, and she put me with Sir George. And that's how I did the, the Live and Let Die album. And, you know, and then... Next day, I'm in a I'm in a cathedral in downtown London with the King Singers singing chamber choir baroque choir uh, with Sir George. You know, it's just like I can't you know I can't believe this. You know, yeah, an, an incredible uh, story. And, and, and it's just one one artist after another after another. And then they used to stick me with all the American clients that came into the studios, and uh, and then they stuck me with Carly Simon and. Uh, uh, that was my first credited recording as an engineer. Uh, that's that's so, a sentence that I hope to say in my life sometime. They stuck me with Carly Simon. <laughs> Things I haven't said for a hundred hours. I, didn't, I, didn't I know, I'm, like I'm that. Kidding, I know, I know, but I like to be stuck with George Martin or Carly Simon. You know, you want to stick me with Elton John, all right, whatever. So, so I totally get it. But you know, in a world where young people switch jobs every four years, you know, perseverance. In, in, in any career is often a rare commodity. And you've been in entertainment for, as you said, 50 years in, ja in uh, June. You mm -hmm. continue to hone your craft. Where does that endurance come from? Is it just about passion? Is it about knowledge? Where do you get that from? Yeah, you know, I love media. Um, I, love, uh, I love when uh, uh, people would listen to my recordings, you know, in a club. I'd love to see a, an empty dance floor. And then, you know, on comes a record that you mixed. And <laughs> The next thing you know, there's, you know, 300 people on the dance floor, you know, uh, grooving to it. You know, that's kind of like what kept me going, you know, and, you know, and, and it was continual sales, you know, that helped, you know, and then uh, a nice flow of gold and platinum records, you know, down the line. That's, that helps, you know, that keeps, that keeps the motivation going, right? Of course. Definitely. And, and when we talk about motivation going, it's like a pay it forward thing. So now it's not just about you anymore. Uh, what do artists need from AMG to get the most out of their careers and their brands? Well, you know, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's all about uh, data uh, today. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I call up my friend uh, 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 Monty Littman uh, from Republic Records and say, Monty, you know, he runs, he signed Ariana Grande. So it's got the biggest pop label on the planet right now. And they're owned by Universal. And I say, Monty, I got a, you know, this cute little Filipino girl, cute as a button, you know, 16 years old, phenomenal pipes. He goes, yeah, okay, send me the data. And I go like, well, you want an MP3? You want a wave? He goes, no, 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 send me the data. I want to see the data, right? And I go, you want to hear the music? He goes, no, 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 F the music. I want to hear the, I want to see the data, you know? And that's where it starts today, you know? But it, it's kind of similar to like, you know, how many, when I was doing these dance recordings, you know, how many people could you get on the dance floor, you know? And that's the attraction to the, to the recording. Right. And then people would call up the radio stations back in the day. Oh, yeah, I heard it in the night. And that kind of spurred sales. And that would make you jump in the car, go to Walmart, buy the CD or buy the 12 inch recording. Uh, but it, it doesn't operate that way uh, anymore because there is no more CD and there is no more record departments in Walmarts. And, uh, they, you know, radio doesn't 
radio's kind of become this obsolete format, you know, that, that doesn't sell recordings anymore, you know. Oh, definitely. Things, things have changed, you know, uh, apples and oranges now. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, we do, we do know the glory, but not the story. So it's been a phenomenal career and it ain't over yet, as they say. But right. Mark, what obstacles have you had to overcome in your career to continue to be successful? Uh, what obstacles? Uh, people believing in what you're doing. Um, somebody's out there that can always do it better, but uh, they don't want to pay for them. So you kind of get a break, you know, when you, okay, I'll do it for, you know, I'll do it for 3000 instead of 5000 you know? And so that kind of got, got, kept me going, you know? Plus, you know, working at Vanguard was a tremendous experience, you know, working at a record label for 12 years uh, with Maynard and Seymour. They were two very seasoned record guys and they knew the business. And they really just let me take the ball and run with it at the studio because they didn't know anything about the dance business. They just knew that they were putting out 12 inches that were selling, you know, 400,000 copies, you know? And, uh, and they basically... It cost me a day, cost of a day in the studio with me to do the remix, you know? Well, excellent advice. And uh, what, what don't we know? There's the glitz and the glamour. What does the average person not know about this business that they should? It's really hard, it's really hard work, right? Nobody gives you anything, right? It's really hard work, especially harder today because you got to bring that data to the table on an artist. I don't care who produces the song, who wrote the song, it doesn't matter, right? You gotta bring this data to the table, right? And, and if you had uh, a niece or nephew, 15, 17 years old, Hi, Uncle Mark, I really wanna get into this business. Uh, they say, I, I hear all the time actors on shows say, yeah, my son wanna be an actor. What I said to him was, don't do it. And it's like this big gazillionaire saying, don't do it. So. Uh, it's their passion. You really believe in it. What would, what advice would you give? Uh, you know, the, the business changes every six months, every six months. There's a, there's a new app out there that you got to get on There's You know, there's a new way to deliver the music. Uh, um, and there's new ways of exploiting the music to generate revenues. And, and you need to be on top of those areas of, of exploitation. I mean, that's why we have, you know, we service film, television, video games ad agencies, movie trailer companies, you know, that's, these are the companies you have to go after that will pay you money to use your music in their film. I mean, we just put a song in a, in a European car ad. They paid my client 175,000 euros. One song, one European car ad for one year term, just for Europe. The numbers are pretty good. If they want that piece of music bad enough, against that car ad, aside from the fact that it's all the car companies and the mobile phone companies that have the money to spend on these, these copyrights. That's why you always hear original masters and compositions on you know, these, these mobile phone ads. You know, you'll hear an original you know, Teddy Pendergrass recording. I mean, these are really expensive recordings to license to, you know, for into visual formats. Yeah, I feel that a lot of people, uh, you see kind of the genesis of it when some of these young artists start out you see them four years later and sometimes when they talk the business aspect comes into it and i've always found that to be very interesting how they start to do their own thing make their own decisions and it's really it's not always about ego it's about things they've learned yeah i and, say that a lot you know ego aside guys right. right what's the dollars and cents of this deal you know and yeah you're totally right e ego aside for sure well, what's i'm sure you remember this uh what was your greatest business failure in your in your long career? Um, greatest business failure. Uh, you know, I, I've been independent for so long um, as an independent producer and engineer and mixer and and now media company uh, owner. Um, you know, certainly get, getting getting the, the grasp of the media business. You know, twenty years ago when you're going through that change. Uh, when the media, you know, the, the MP3s and you know the whole online uh, piracy uh, issue, that was a, that was a tough challenge. It, it was even tough for the major labels to get their head around what the hell was happening, you know. Oh yeah. So for me, that that was the toughest uh, area. And then you know, getting into the movie business has been has been tough. But we're we're starting to make a breakthrough, acquisitioning really cool projects, and 
you know, um, our first release was the Drake movie. Uh, we did that about five years ago. Um, we did a deal with the uh, Spectacast, the division of AMC. Um, so we did a bunch of theaters worldwide and it worked out great for us, you know? Excellent. It's so much, such a vast amount of work that you're doing. It's, it's, it's great that you're doing so many different things now. So, uh, not that 50 years isn't enough, but what is next for Mark Berry? What's, what's the next 50 looking like? The next 50. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, we love this movie business. Uh, we just rearranged our deal at factory here in Canada. So it involves a co-financing structure on projects. So we're now we have the ability to see a cool script uh, uh, and acquisition it and to get it into development. Obviously doing films here in Canada, there's lots of advantages. We have an exchange rate of about 28 today. So, you know, if you come up here with a $10 million budget, you get an extra 2.8 million in just in, just in services. Um, and uh, the film and television, the acquisitioning and the growing of that side of the business is is where we're we're going now. And we're also uh, harmoniously putting in the music into that as well. So if, a, if we need music in one of our films and TV shows, that music is coming from our publishing catalog. So we're we're internally uh, utilizing our own assets. That's great. We can pull from one part of your company t- from another part and mesh them. Uh, th- that that's great. Uh, Absolutely. So- yeah, so great stuff. So, Mark Berry, I cannot thank you enough. I thank you so much for being here today and sharing your passion for helping artists achieve success. Uh, really thank appreciate you being here. And, and to the viewers, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Mark, thanks great. so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Life Stories with Mark Hoberman. To contact Mark, email him at info at lifestorieswithmarkhoberman.com or visit him on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Thank you for watching Life Stories with Mark Hoberman.